Thanks for joining me here on News Today. Ghana is expecting an envoy from Cote d'Ivoire this week to finalize the implementation of the ruling of the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, ITLOS. Now, uh, for Information Minister Mustafa Hamid tells journalists President Kufuado met with his Ivorian counterpart on the sidelines of the United Nations General Assembly where they decided to fully implement the ITLOS ruling. In ITLOS, um, the two presidents have agreed that they will all abide by the judgment of the court and will work together to ensure the smooth implementation of um, the judgments of the court. In this coming week, um, the Ivorian president would send envoys to Ghana, and together the two governments will tell the world what it is that they are willing to do in respect of this judgment. So for now, um, the president will hold his peace until that engagement with the Ivorian envoys. And then we can let the Ghanaian people know what the formal positions of the two governments are in regards to the ITLOS judgment. Former Attorney General Marietta Brewer Piaopong says though the chamber dismissed some of Ghana's claims, she would not change anything if given another opportunity. The arguments by Ghana before the tribunal were, were that there was a, a tacit agreement between Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire to recognize that maritime boundary. In addition, they were, they were stopped from resisting that particular maritime boundary because of, of course, the, the practice over the years, I mean decades, about 50 years of practice. And when I talk about practice, I'm talking about legislation on both sides, letters on both sides, and more importantly, the maps that um, our, our, our various petroleum, national petroleum um, organizations had produced over the years. Mm. Uh, and on their side, there's Petrosi, and then on our side, there's GNPC. And so we said that um, there was a tacit agreement, and then we also um, pleaded that they were st stopped from challenging this maritime boundary because they had allowed us to recognize that for years that this was the boundary. The alternative argument was that the alternative argument was that uh, this particular line, which in any case had been recognized by the parties, followed the equidistance principle, which is the internationally recognized method of delimiting maritime boundaries. Mm. And that even if it was n the issue of customary uh, of um, how do you call it, tacit agreement and Estobel did not hold sway with the court that the tribunal was free to delimit that the, our boundaries for us using the equidistance principle. We further argued that there were no relevant circumstances for which the line should be shifted. And of course, Cote d'Ivoire did not agree with that. They were of the view that um, the bisector principle was the equitable method mm. of, of delimiting our boundaries and that even if you used the equidistance principle there were relevant circumstances for which reason the line ought to be shifted in their favor the tribunal considered these arguments of course as far as we were concerned 50 years of practice and relying on that line meant something and so we pushed the argument strongly and as lawyers I think we'll we're obliged to push that argument on behalf of, of Ghana. The tribunal disagreed with us, mm. but agreed that the equidistance method was the right method and that there were no relevant circumstances for which reason the line should be mm. shifted. And so we are where we are today. Yeah. Where but on the, on the claim of tacit agreement, yes. on hindsight, you know, looking at how things went, would you have changed anything? Would you have done things differently? We would n not have done things differently. For us, it meant something. 50 years of practice meant something to us as lawyers. And so we, would, we were obliged as lawyers to, to, to put that argument to the tribunal. Mm. 
Now, there's now no doubt that Ghana's 10 oil fields and expected revenue will not be affected in any way by Saturday's ruling of ITLOS. Petroleum economist Dr. Theo e. Champon says, with ITLOS's clear delimitation of the boundary between Ghana and Côte d'Ivoire and the subsequent plotting of the 10 fields by Talo Oil and other stakeholders, it's now clear that Ghana's present oil fields will remain intact and in the nation's possession. He, however, suspects future oil prospects may be affected as geology is no respecter of artificial boundaries. Speaking on news desk today, Dr. Theo e. Champong expects this week's meeting between Ghana and Côte d'Ivoire's envoy to clearly show uh, such future discoveries, how such future discoveries will be dealt with by both parties. The, the key thing really is that you would have made or drilled some oil wells in there and this case particularly is about oil. Of course, there are other resources within the region, but if you did make a discovery and you found out that you know the reservoir goes on the other side of the border, then necessarily you would have to get into some form of you know uh, agreement with the other party, in this case being Cote d'Ivoire. There are a number of ways that has been done uh, we, uh, you know, by, by way of practice. Some would enter into a joint development agreement or zone like we have in Nigeria and, and Sao Tome and Principe if you have resources going the other side. In other instances too, you can have a government actually pay off you know, the, mm -hmm. the other party by way of equity without having to go through those detailed steps of signing you know, a new agreement. But that's all driven by the, the volume of those resources that we do discover. So if we are to make another big oil and gas discovery, which goes on the other side of the border, mm -hmm then I would suspect that the Ivorians might want to come in and actually push us towards some sort of unit agreement. If it's not that much, then you can, of course, pay them off, you know, uh, by um, equity. Yeah, Talo has come out with the maps of their oil reserves vis-a-vis -vis the new boundary that was delim delimited by the special chamber. Looking at that, would we need to enter any sort of agreement like this with Cote d'Ivoire? No. So on the current oil fields that we have, uh, namely the 10 oil field, and then the health discoveries and all that. We don't need to do or enter into any special agreement with them. So that is the certainty that this ruling brings for us. But remember, we're still exploring for oil within that region. Mm -hmm. And uh, with the way the geology is, the way with the geography is, it is very likely that you might find something that actually crisscrosses onto the other side, in which case you then have to you know, necessarily enter some form of, you know, agreement mm. with uh, the either, either party. And mm. that's what I suspect the envoy coming in and the other parties coming in would want to, to discuss. So with the current fields that we have, they are not affected mm. at all by that. But it is very likely going in the future with more exploration, with more activity, you might find something that you know goes mm. on the other side of the border. Right. Let's not stay on Ghana Cote d'Ivoire relations but away from oil because Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire have started collaboration to ensure that two nations get a fair deal in cocoa pricing and other issues relating to the sector. This decision was taken by presidents of the two nations on the sidelines of the just ended United Nations General Assembly in New York. Currently, the West African neighbors produce 60% of uh, the nation's cocoa. We, however, gain only 5 to 6% of the hundred billion dollar chocolate industry information minister mustafa hamid tells journalists the meeting is part of efforts to change this narrative he met with people who play in the cocoa industry in the world to sell ghana's case um, as far as our cocoa is concerned um, he also met with the ivorian president and in the case of our relationship with Cote d'ivoire apart from it loss, which judgment was just delivered um, over the weekend, Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire have agreed that as the two major controllers of the cocoa market, the world cocoa market, we need to collaborate more and do things in sync, you know, so that we can determine um, the prices at which we sell our cocoa to the world. Otherwise, if we play as individual nations, then it will be difficult for us to be able to be assertive um, on the cocoa markets. 
So together with President Alassane Ouattara, they had very fruitful engagements. Well, Ghana's granite export potential could soon see a revamp with the introduction of a new variety resistant to poisonous substances known as aflatoxins. The variety known as Crops Daishi is one of four released in Kumasi this year by the CSIR Crops Research Institute. Chrissy Deborah reports. Ghana is said to have made $2.4 billion from non-traditional exports, of which granite accounted for $6.4 million in 2013. Government projects to earn $5 billion from the sector by 2019. Major impediment to this target, however, is a highly toxic substance known as a flatoxin produced by fungus. The presence of aflatoxin in foods, and specifically granites, is a serious threat to human health. They cause stunting in children. They suppress the immune system of human beings. And even if people eat it, they can die from it. Fungi and aflatoxin infection of crops occur during pre-harvest and post-harvest. There's, a, there's a, a project, Feed the Future, USID Feed the Future project which seeks to reduce aflatoxin contamination in our ground variety. The project has been running for three years now, and we are telling farmers how to reduce aflatoxin on the field, and especially at the harvest, where we ask them to uh, dry them on tarpaulins, but not on bare floors. Two aggressive efforts have been made towards mitigating aflatoxin contamination. Ghana can't export granite to the EU, due to the presence of unacceptable levels of aflatoxin. Try to open gently. The research center has been working to improve granite varieties for the past eight years. Most of the granite varieties released in Ghana from 2000 to 2012 had good yield future and also tolerant to rosette and other foliar diseases. Do varieties like Yenyawoso could mature within 85 to 90 days, other varieties become ready for harvest a bit later. Crops this year also takes 85 to 90 days to mature and can produce 2.9 tons per hectare. One, the materials are early maturing, they are tolerant to diseases, and the yields are better than the local material from which we develop the new material out of them. The other three new varieties are crops pion, crops in Katia, and crops abeyi, all of which take 90 to 95 days to mature. Together with this year, they are said to have high oil content and tolerant to granite rosette disease. For Joy News, Kwesi Debra. Hopefully the Disha variant will help Ghana in our granite production. But lab news checks have revealed worrying sanitation and health challenges in Kumasi as food is prepared and sold near piled up dumping sites and often choked drains. Fish smoking hubs at Asafo and catering sites at Dr. Mensa share space with some of the filthiest gutters in the metropolis. Love FM Sarastas Sari Donko has been crisscrossing the city to assess the extent of risk for public health. Many traders in Kumasi prefer to occupy and transact business on streets and pavements rather than designated market centers. City authorities are overwhelmed by the situation at Kejitia, Adum PZ, Dr. Mensa, Alaba, and other commercial hubs in the city center taken over by traders. Ongoing reconstruction of the Kejitia project, which precedes the proposed rebuilding of the Kumasi Central Market, has worsened the space situation. Besides the danger of humans competing with vehicles for space, the large volumes of people create insanitary conditions at risk of public health. Food is sold by choked, stinking, dumping site points, though city authorities collect daily tolls. This is Dr. Mensa. At the heart of Kumasi, what we are witnessing here is filth, waste, stench. The smell alone is so bad. The question you ask yourself is how do people live and work? 
in an environment like this, they contribute to the filth, they stay within it, they smell it, and they live by it. But this is a place where KMA makes so much money in revenue collection, tax, and all that. But behind me here is a bad, muddy, filthy road which drivers ply every day. This site you're seeing here is an avalanche of filth created by the people who live here. So we are talking about the people and the attitude, an assembly that is not enforcing its bylaws to ensure that people do not commit, in quotes, environmental suicide. This is where all the food vendors throw their liquid waste. Even though there is a dumping site around, people dump waste here, others urinate and sometimes defecate here. We want them every day, but they come back. The KMA should do something about this because we also pay levies here. A few meters from this filthy site area at Dr. Mensa is this cooking hub where a number of food vendors take supplies for retail. The unhygienic conditions and the sweat of the caterers combine to expose patrons to danger. Some of the women here say though they have undergone food handling tests at the beginning of the year, they are yet to know the outcome and even receive their certificates. Yet, they cook for the public. She says they come here themselves to perform the medical examination. They make sure people with diseases get treated before they are allowed to cook. We have been screened this year, but the results are yet to be handed to us. The situation at the Asafo cold store area perhaps is worse. This choked and filthy drain is site for open defecation despite being Kumasi's biggest hub for fresh and smoked fish. I shall stand here right on the main Kumasi Asafo drain Three words come into my mind, filth, disease, and squalor. This drain witnesses one of the dangerous things that you can find in Kumasi. People defecate in this drain. People dump all manner of unsavory things right into this drain. But then, this place is also home to where we sell fish, where a chunk of the city's smoked fish come from. To my left here, as you can see, this is where we smoke majority of the fish that is sold on the open market in Kumasi. But it is close to this drain where people use as a defecation point, where they dump stuff, where all the filth pass in here. The Kumasi Metropolitan Assembly's night cleanup, spearheaded by City Mayor Osei Sibi Entry, in addition to sanitation by law enforcement, perhaps needs intensified effort to avert looming danger. Sporting for Joy News, Erastus Asaridonko. You're watching Joy News today with me, Ben Sabubedu. We'll take a quick breather. We'll bring you more news in a moment. Many thanks for your company here on Joy News today. Now, students in second cycle institutions are calling on the Ghana Education Service to institute proper counseling units in schools to provide coordinated guidance. They say such structure is needed to reduce rampant teenage pregnancy and acts of sodomy on the various campuses across the country. Participants made the call at a mentoring and coaching seminar organized in Kumase by the Ghana U.S. Department of State Alumni Association. Nana Sensu Mensa has more in this report. It is unclear, statistically, the extent of teenage pregnancy in the second cycle institutions. However, a report by international NGO, Marie Stopes Ghana, reveals 57,000 teenage pregnancies were recorded nationwide in the first half of this year. 
Ashanti region alone accounts for 9,100 of the number, according to figures released last month. This, perhaps, informs the position of the students. Head Prefect of St. Louis Senior High School, Frida Edu, leads the advocacy. And with this session, I've learned that what we feel at this stage is normal. We shouldn't feel guilty, but rather we should seek for help. And this section, I'm sure, has benefited the students, but the those who came here, the various schools that were present here, we've all benefited from the, the talks that we had. And I would like to urge the GES also to set up counseling units in every SHS school because it is very good that whenever you are faced with a problem, you need someone to talk to. You can't just keep it to yourself. So with this setup of um, counseling units in the various schools will, will, be very, will be very helpful for all the students' body as well. And also, when they set up these um, counseling units, they should also assign professionals to listen to the cries of students. Experts in family planning and reproductive health, Dr. Enes Kwakon explains the incumbency on government to heed the students' call. One of the key things that we have tried to suggest to the schools that look after these young women before they go into the world is to establish a full-time counseling unit so that when these young adults have uh, problems and they are confused with their careers, choices, and things that have to do with their reproductive health life ahead. Uh, they, they can seek counseling advice from these units, and that will help them make you know, the right decisions going forward into the future. I think all second cycle schools should take counseling very seriously and have a, an entire unit dedicated to it full time and pay staff and train them to be professionally competent to man them. Meanwhile, President of Ghana U.S. Department of State Alumni Association, Nanaya Pia, is optimistic of the impact of the program. When women are empowered, not only do they help their communities, they help their society. Can you imagine a healthy woman who knows what food to give to her children so that they are healthy children who won't burden the national health insurance or the national insurance health scheme. So healthy women make a healthy nation. So empowering them will make them make the right opportunities, not only for themselves, but their children and the communities they work in. So it is, it is a responsibility to empower women because they make the right choices. Nana Sansumensa, reporting for Joy News. Interior Minister Ambrose Dairy has assured local farmers in the country the government is not going to import food for the free SHS program, but will rather depend on food produced locally to feed students at public senior high schools in the country. He said government has engaged the National Buffer Stock Company to buy food produced locally for supplies to various senior high schools in the country. Now, there, have been, there has been concern from some food suppliers of the various schools that they'll be out of business with the implementation of the free SHS policy. Ambrose Derry gave the assurance at the Upper West Regional launch of the free SHS policy at Nandom in the Upper West Region. Rafiq Salam reports from, Nam from Nandom. The Upper West Regional launch of the free education policy by the government was preceded by a meeting between Interior Minister Ambrose Derry and heads of some senior high schools in the Nondom district. Addressing the concerns of the schools at the launch of the policy, which was heavily attended by heads of departments, assembly members, teachers, students from some selected basic and second cycle schools in the Nondom district, Interior Minister Ambrose Derry stated that the implementation of the policy is a well thought out plan by the government intended to give all Ghanaian children equal access to education and not a lip service. We know that the Northern Scholarship has always been a problem. The headmaster of Nandom confirmed that the, the scholarship has been debt, indebted since last year's second term. But I'm happy to inform you that for this first term, the government of Nana Dodanko Akufuado has advanced and released 65 million Ghana cities for this term. The president is committed to making sure that this happens. Apart from these payments, he's also working hard on recouping, paying up the arrears so that what will happen? 
so that our children will have quality education. So I've come today to find out what is happening on the ground, to come show you that Nana Donako Akufado is not a terrorist, it's not lip service. As part of measures by the government to help boost the income of local farmers in the country, Ambrose Derry announced local farmers will have a key role to play in the implementation of the program. The president has decided that school feeding must be done by the food we produce, the food our farmers produce, and not imported food, so that our farmers would be supported to continue farming. So this year, there's a buffer store company that is coming out. Suppliers will be registered, and they will buy the food and give to buffer stock. Buffer stock will pay the farmers immediately, not what we are owing in Nandom Sec since last year. No, the farmers will be paid immediately. Then buffer stock will keep the food and then supply Nandom Sec as you want it. District Chief Executive for Nandom, Ansolo Nante Dios, expressed concern over the poor performance of students at the basic education certificate examination. The district BC results for 2014 was 12%. That of 2015 was 13%. In 2016 was 21%. However, you will all agree with me that the increase to 21% in 2016 was still not the best of results at all. Considering the fact that Nandam not long ago has always produced excellent BECE results in the region. If such appalling results continue, then many of our school people will be missing out of the free senior high school policy. Reporting for Dwayne News, Rafik Salam, Nandom. Local governance expert George J. Bafo pines the election of metropolitan, municipal, and district chief executives, MMDCs on partisan lines, is the surest way to ensure that officials at the local government level uh, are able to hold the state accountable for the role they play. He bemoans the fact that presently the state disperses resources to the district level at their own convenience, which affects the operations of the MMDAs. He was commenting on the recent proposal by the Center for Democratic Development, CDD, that the appointment of MMDCEs should be more professional. Research officer at CDD, Mohamed Awal, believes without the proper allocation of resources to the district level, the election of MMDCEs will not improve the efficiency of the assemblies in any way. Today, the question that we need to ask ourselves more is to ask, what is it that local government can legitimately hold central government accountable for? Does our policy and institutional framework clearly define this? Because in our engagement on the DLT, the question about, ah, my common fund hasn't come, so what have you done about it? Mm. Who did you hold accountable? Mm. If we still would have elections, and there will still be these problems about how can the local government act as horizontal accountability, hold central government accountable for failing, for example, say, to transfer the local government funds and clearly define the boundaries of authority and responsibility, I think that would better enhance the election process and then local government mm. uh, development as a whole. But if we can all have elections and there will still be existing problems as we have them today, where boundaries of responsibility and really holding urgency to agency accountable for not delivering on certain commitments and mm. promises, I think that we will still not have a developed local government system that is really accountable to the people. So in the absence of that, the elections would not have the effect? The it effect. will never have the effect, as I tell okay. you. Because if essentially you elect a DCE, he's elected, but still physical decentralization requires that certain money has to come from the central level. And it's from the opposition party. And what we've known, even in Benin, mm. in Senegal, in South Africa, where opposition parties have held those level, those city government. And the central government decides to subvert it because if it performs well, the credit will go to his party and so mm. on and so forth. Then there will still be problems. Okay. And so there has to be clarity, both institutionally and in policy, mm. to clearly define in which areas can the local government mm. hold central government accountable. Okay. So that if you are subverting me, I have the law on my side to go to court or to seek for some remedial mm. actions that will allow me to be able to perform for the expectations of my own people. If we right. don't do that, really, our elections will not have meaning as, as mm. we want them to have. Local governance expert George J. Bafo agrees with this sentiment, saying one way of ensuring uh, accountability is 
proper structuring of the elections. Look at the constitution article 240. And it talks about, or even like enjoying parliament to enact the native legislation that will transfer competences, resources, and means to MMDA for development. And that's an intent to be. The assemblies have the capacity under their, their establishment provision to go to court to compel government to, to abide by some of these provisions the constitution. But because of the structure of the assembly, you know, MMGCs who are supposed to uh, have any process of uh, ensuring accountability of central government to MMGA is an appointee of the president. So he does not even make a move to go to court. Mm -hmm. You look at Article 252, the constitution enjoins parliament to set aside a minimum of 5% of the total revenues of Ghana for distribution to MMDA for development. First of all, who determines the quantum of resources that are supposed to, to be available to the nation Ghana within a specific year? Who determines that? The assemblies are supposed to benefit from that resource. But they are not part of the determining factor, you know, that ensures that indeed 5% of the total revenues have been set aside for MMD. You look at the distribution regime. Mm -hmm. A lot of institutions are benefiting from the, this assembly common fund. These are all unconstitutional and, and illegal practices. Mm -hmm. But the assemblies, even though they have the capacity to go to court and challenge these things, will not do so or will not be able to do so because mm. of the kind of structure arrangement that we have in place. Mm. You look at guidelines on the, on the distribution. Government, central government have been compelling assemblies to utilize the resources the way the central government determines. And, mm -hmm. I mean, delays are, are, are very, very, you know, associated with the, the disassembly common fund. Okay. Sometimes they go into areas for, 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 for a whole okay. year. Meanwhile, the law requires that the releases shall be done on quarterly basis. Mm. It's, it's even in the constitutional mm. arrangement in Article 252. The government will not abide by this provision. Mm. But the assemblies do not have what it takes to go to court to compel government. So we are talking about central government accountability. Mm. We are talking about the assembly's ability to, to, to function effectively and, and reach the expectations of the people we have to make the assemblies more independent and more autonomous so that they can, they can hold on to these accountable principles. Right. And right. for that matter, MMDCs ought to be elected. All the assembly members ought to be elected. The 30% allocation to central government ought to be, to be, to be done away with. Mm. So we have a fully, well, fully functional assembly that will be accountable to the people and be able to deliver on their mandate. Away from local governance issues, Ghana can overcome its socioeconomic challenges if the country makes use of research findings. That's according to Provost of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences of the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, Professor Imuro Brahma. Now he says that government is better placed to pursue appropriate policies with adequate briefing on outcomes of citizen interaction. He was speaking at the second conference of Sociological and Anthropological Society of Ghana. Rafino Seakono reports. Ghana, like some of her neighbors, is blessed with abundance of natural resources. Despite the endowment, the country is crippled by many economic and social challenges of poverty, hunger, corruption and poor governance, amongst others. Successive governments have tried to mitigate the effects of such problems. In Professor Brimer's estimation, however, they have all failed because they failed to tackle them on informed premises. Um, if we have objectively verified solutions from this phenomenon that can be communicated to politicians, then government will be able to address these issues uh, in a better way. Because right now, we all acknowledge that just stopping the illegal money without alternatives, without viable alternatives, without knowing the root causes, without knowing the players, the interest of the players in there, we will not be able to solve the, solve the problem because we understand just as the ban is on, uh, in some hidden areas, people are still going around doing the whole uh, thing and they are hoping that very soon government will be tired of 
the, 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 uh, enforcing the ban, and then they'll go back to business as usual. Sociological and Anthropological Association seeks to spearhead discourse on contemporary African agenda. This year's conference focuses on the Sustainable Development Goals. Dr. Peter Juma is Head of Department Sociology and Social Work of KNUSD. The Sustainable Development Goals are very laudable um, policy directives and research is the bedrock to policy. It is very important that we conduct scientific research. Um, it is, we have been doing that. People have been doing researches. It's not just now that people are doing researches related to the objectives of um, the development goals. But now we want to try and then expose, make it clear, let people really know what is happening in the area of academia. So Reporting for Joy News, Ralphina Osayakono. Vice Chancellor of the University of Cape Coast, Professor Joseph Gate Ampia, has sent a strong signal to first, first students of the university. Now, he says the university will not hesitate to rusticate them if they engage in acts of vandalism and other untoward behavior that drag the name of the university into disrepute. Currently, the university is in court over the rustication of 22 students of the university following clashes between Atlantic Hall and Ogwa Hall early this year. Speaking at the matriculation ceremony for first students, the vice chancellor counseled the university has gone through a lot to attain the accolade, a university of competitive choice, and won't sacrifice that for anything. There are many things we have banned in this university because of the behavior of students. And therefore, you should find out what you, have, you do not have to do and what you have to do. Because when you are caught in the web, we will not set you free. We will ask you to go and sit home for some time and reflect before you come back. And we are in court because we've, we've rusticated some students. So we will not mind rusticating others if they go about doing the same thing. So you must find out what we, we, we should not do and what we should do. And don't let the continuing students mold you into their own form. You must be independent and think for yourself. You came here to study and not to cause disturbances. Therefore, not all of you are involved in this, but I'm speaking to all of you. So that if you know those who are involved in those sorts of activities, you advise them to desist from it. When students meet, it should have been a joyful moment. But soon, throwing of stones, welding of cutlasses, and so on and so forth becomes the order of the day. It has made us ban a lot of student meetings. So if you are here and people are encouraging you to resurrect some of these things, you must be careful. When they come, tell them that we know the university rules will not allow us to do that. Our rules and regulations have been collated in the following books. Students' Handbook, Academic Programs, Policies and Regulations, and Brochure on Graduate Studies. Find these books and read them. They are ready. You'll be given those that you have not been given. You'll be given these. You're watching Joy News today with me, Benis Abubedis. <laughs>